Okay, I just arrived at this station here, Smith & Martin, Apache Boulevard station, uh, which is the transit station for the metro here at cul-de-sac. <laughs> Welcome. Pleasure to meet you. John Simmerman with Active Towns Channel. Welcome to Cul-de-Sac. Yeah, thank you. I am super excited. Excited that you're here. To do that. Yeah, and, and here we are right at the, the front sign. So, uh, yeah, let's, let's take a ride. All right. Check it out. Got to ask you a little bit about that uh, mural that you have right behind you. Yeah, so we've got a lot of art at Cul-de-Sac, all done by local artists. This one is done by... Frank Gonzalez, and it's meant to uh, show the connection to the desert that we live in. What's the significance of, of the, uh, the flowers and the artwork? So cacti are the defining aspect of the Sonoran Desert, yeah. and this represents that. This is the first mural that people see when they pass by. So tell me a little bit about you know, the history and what inspired you to, uh, to do this. To make cities better. Most people in the U.S. want to live in a walkable neighborhood, but we really stopped building them with the advent of the car. Right. And it's possible to build them again. We saw this so clearly in the data. And it, you, we use a portfolio of transportation options where residents, instead of having a private vehicle, they get around with light rail. You see where I have a light rail on site, um, electric bikes, electric scooters. There's great amenities on site uh, and also ride share and AV ride hail. Okay. And these are, you know, those last two and e-bikes are relatively new technologies. Right. And so that's, that's the why now of this. Yeah. And we've got, you know, people riding past us here. I was on the Metro, the light rail system earlier. Uh, super fun. I actually rode here from the airport yesterday. So it, that, that was a lot of fun too. Yeah. Did you come down Rio Salado? Uh, I came down, I was on the canal path yeah. for a while. Yeah. And into the, into the university campus and all of that. Uh, you know, we're gonna roll past this uh, really cool bike shop here. We'll get around the corner so it's a little quieter, but let's talk a little bit about, you know, this partnership that you have yeah. with Archer Bikes. Yeah, let's talk about that. So we knew from the beginning, we wanted to have great amenities on site, and we knew that it had to have a bike shop, right? Yeah. Especially with the uh, proliferation of electric bikes, we wanted to have folks who were experts and we found Archers and they're the best bike shop in town and they really understand regular bikes and also electric bikes and they have a wonderful selection. Um, they also have great service and our residents love working with them. That is great. And so really this, you know, ends up being a, a valuable activity asset for the entire neighborhood. I'm sure yeah. they're pulling in clients from, from all over. Yeah, and uh, they bring new residents who can, uh, potential residents who can see it for the first time. They also, sure. customers that come to Archer's Bikes also go to our other retail and it creates a feedback loop. And just in case it wasn't obvious, what we were, you had mentioned earlier is part of the vision is, is really because of the proximity to the light rail, the station right in front of the development, uh, these other sort of amenities that are in place, you're, you're, the dream is really to help people live a car-free lifestyle. Uh, doesn't mean that they never use a car, but they're not having to feel like they're, they have to be addicted to them and they have to own one. Right. People are happier living in a walkable neighborhood. It just has to be built in the right way. And that's part of this portfolio of options that make it that way. And to your point, ride sharing and AV ride hail are still using cars, but they don't use parking spaces. And that means that we can build a design that's completely different. And what, what people find is that if they switch from driving a car to being a, a passenger in ride hail, uh, it's a much better experience. You're not stressed, you don't have road rage. We all become the worst versions of ourselves in a car behind the wheel. And, uh, and you can spend time reading, talking, etc. And so people really prefer that. Yeah, fantastic. Now we're gonna head right uh, back into um, some of the main areas of the development here. And uh, we'll, we'll roll past a couple of other key amenities that you have in both a, a restaurant that's in place and also a grocery store. So let's go check them out. All right. And Ryan, while we're uh, you know, going past some of the, the construction site here, uh, talk a little bit about you know, the overall vision and when you're looking at having a full build out. Yeah, so today we've got 
35 buildings. Uh, most of them are open. The last batch of those will open in February. And we have another 25 buildings under construction that'll start opening next year, as well as more amenities like the pool uh, and, a, and a park. And then there's phases after that. Uh, so it'll be a few years before we get everything open. Ultimately, we'll have 1,000 people. Uh, and th what we started with first was this retail area that we're getting to now. This is the hub of energy at cul-de-sac. And what we're on right now, this is the most iconic part of cul-de-sac. This is the Paseo. It's a car-free street that's only used by emergency vehicles. We worked with the fire department and other groups in the city uh, to make sure that this works for everybody's needs. Uh, and it's in a wonderful pedestrian space for bikes and scooters. And that's something that people love. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we'll actually have an event here tonight, yes. uh, Little Choya, yeah. and uh, I, I, I'll, I'll have to leave you a, a little earlier here for another appointment and all that, but I'll be back. I'll be back for L Little Choya. Yeah, we're <laughs> excited for it, uh, and I can tell you a bit about it. Yeah, let's, uh, let's uh, pull up here, uh, get, get you in the sun a little yeah, bit. Yeah, so w this is a good place to pause because we'll see Little Choya over in this area tonight. I'll shoot some video of all of that, but we're also paused both in front of the restaurant as well as the grocery stores. Yeah, Little Choya is every Thursday and it's gonna be tonight. We're expecting over 500 people. It's a night market where we get local vendors and it's a way for people to experience cul-de-sac. It's a gathering point for our community and the outside community. And we love it because it draws people to see cul-de-sac for the first time. There's a lot of energy and we have music and I'm excited for you to see it later. Yeah, and how long has Little Choya been going on? We started Little Choya before the project opened. We actually started it on the construction site um, back, uh, back because we wanted to uh, bring some energy to the site before we opened. And we started it and it was a little bit of an experiment and it did really well and it's been building momentum ever since. And now that we do it right in the full cul-de-sac, the real part, um, it's really thriving. Fantastic. Now we have two really important buildings here right behind you, you're being framed by the restaurant. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, this is Cocina Chiwas and this is a wonderful restaurant. Actually it was named as one of the, t the best five restaurants in town. It's a husband wife couple named Armando and Nadia and we've been working with them for a couple of years to build it. It's their pride and joy. Uh, it's Chihuahuan cuisine, it's Mexican food, uh, and it's, it's wonderful. They do dinner five nights a week, uh, and they're also doing brunch. And they also host events, and they're a big part of our neighborhood. Yeah, highly recommend their guacamole and chili rellenos. Highly recommend. I, yeah, I had them last night. They were fantastic. Okay, and then swinging over here, you just popped in to grab a water. Uh, talk a little bit about that. You have a market right here already. Yeah, so this is Street Corner Urban Market, and it's a grocery store, and it's something that our residents love having because it has all the things that they could need, and uh, that's, been, that's been open, and, and it's been a key part of life at Cul-de-Sac. Yeah, I had a chance to talk a little bit to the, the operator this morning, and he was talking a little bit about how uh, really approaching it with a sense of openness and trying to learn from the community and you know what they wanted to see within their grocery store i think it's a, a critical point and he was telling me a story about how you know in southern california with previous markets it was like there was a a format and 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 the corporate structure didn't want to deviate from the format so i think that's really cool that you found an operator that is like you know really really conducive and open to making sure that it's serving the needs of the population. Yeah, that's right. And we're gonna head off in this direction because we also need to see uh, some of your other transportation partners that you have. And as we're rolling towards uh, this, I'm noticing more artwork. So it looks like you have taken the time to dress up which would normally be sort of ugly infrastructure as part of a development. Yeah, there's, we, we, want, we wanted to have a lot of art and so we integrated it into the design from the beginning because it gives a real sense of place. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now I'm noticing uh, we do have some parking available, but it, it looks a little different than most parking that I'm used to seeing. Talk a little bit about the strategies and the partnerships that you have that we can highlight in this area. Yeah, so the parking that you see is for retail and visitors of the residents. So you see folks are setting up for Little Choya. We have a lot of vendors coming today. Uh, some of the partnerships that we have, a big one is Lyft. So our residents all get a discount on Lyft because ride sharing is an important part of getting around. We also have a partnership with Waymo. Phoenix is lucky to be the first city that Waymo is operated in. And 
once they launched their new Jaguars in May, word of mouth spread quickly and it's already one of the most popular ways of getting around. Uh, we also have car rental on site that is for weekend trips and things of that nature. And another mobility partnership that we have is with Electric. So Electric is the number one e-bike company. It's a phenomenal story. The company's only four years old and they're actually based right here in Phoenix. You wouldn't have expected the first car-free neighborhood built from scratch in Phoenix. You wouldn't have expected the first, the best e-bike company in Phoenix, but here we are. So um, the, the, the CEO actually lives in Tempe and uh, over uh, when we were socializing one day, we, he thought, hey, why don't we call part of the Paseo Electric Avenue? And we love that, we, we have a partnership and all the first residents get a free electric XP just like the one I'm on now. Fantastic, that, that is great. I'm also noting too, a lot of permeable pavement through here and I haven't seen any asphalt. Talk a little bit about that. Not a drop of asphalt on the entire site and that and a couple other things contribute to this neighborhood feeling 15 degrees cooler than the apartments next door. Right. And that's kind of an important thing here in Arizona, to be a little cooler. Abs absolutely, you'll really notice it in the summer. Yeah, yeah. And we'll, we'll, we'll notice uh, some design features once we get in the pods too, uh, about the actual architecture, uh, you know, also, you know, heat is, is a key f feature. That, and so when we get in there, you can speak a little bit to some of the design aesthetic uh, that may be in place in this particular development because of the fact that you're in the Sonoran Desert. Absolutely, this is a design that works great in this location. There's some elements that yeah. we'll use in other projects, uh, but some of this is special to this, yeah. this environment. We see some of the vendors coming in for the uh, little Choya. Yeah, and you see some of our micro retailers. Ah, yes, yes. Talk, talk a little bit more about the, the concept here with the micro retailers. Yeah, so we've got our standard retail space. Those are space that's, that's custom mm -hmm. uh, for each use. And then here we have eight, their zone live work where they could be studio apartments or they could be retail. And that's to give flexibility based on demand. Uh, but we've seen demand to, uh, to fill them with retail. And we have a number of great uses. We have uh, a wellness shop. This is our leasing office. And uh, please reach out if you're interested in living at cul-de-sac. Yeah. And the next is a vintage clothing store. This is an esthetician. Over here we have a yoga studio one, run by one of the residents. Okay. We have a Japanese home goods store and we have a tea shop. Fantastic. And there's a, also a salon that'll be in soon. Yeah. Well, speaking of uh, creating a culture of activity and activity assets, we have a fitness center right behind us. Here. Yes, let's show you. Come on in. So, welcome to our gym. We have two floors. And we've, we've been told this is the best, uh, this is one of the best apartment gyms in Arizona. Okay. So uh, someone on our, a woman on our team, she was a bodybuilder, so she helped us design all the right equipment. And we have free weights, we have machines, etc. Upstairs we have an aerobic studio. And today we have a resident lounge upstairs as well. Okay, cool. So I think we are gonna go check out one of the pods. Yeah, and you can see them setting up little choya behind us. Yeah. So let's go into the pods. So we have three pods today. And the area that we're in now, the plaza, that's open to the public, but now we're gonna go into a resident only area. Gotta get the right key. That always helps. Welcome. So welcome to the pod. So as where the buildings that we saw before, those were each unique. These are fabric buildings where each one is unremarkable on its own, but together they form a, a tapestry that forms a very interesting fabric. And what you'll see here is that this, we call this tongue in cheek Mykonos inspired desert modern. Yeah. And the buildings are white, which reflects heat. There's these narrow corridors that create lots of shade. And again, we don't have a drop of asphalt and that contributes to mitigating the heat island effect. And so this will feel 15 degrees cooler than the apartment complex next door. Right, yeah, and so you, you, you said it very nonchalantly, Mykonos, so you're, you're talking about the Greek Isles, right? It's the, yeah, it's tongue, yeah. It's, it's tongue in cheek because yeah, yeah. The, the visuals look like yeah. um, with, with the white buildings. We've yeah. had inspirations from all over the world though. Yeah, yeah, but and really the key thing is what we were talking about when we were talking about the heat out there 
is that, yeah, this is a desert, and so your architecture and the ability to create shade and cooling environments and you know, maybe even channeling some breezes, really important. Yeah, the, there's a number of breezeways as well throughout the project. Yeah, fantastic. And I love uh, you know, some of the more natural desert flowering uh, trees and bushes as well. A little yeah, bit of pop of color. Yeah, by not having uh, residential parking, we're able to get 55% landscape space. Mm -hmm. And uh, even in the six months or so that we've been open, the maturing of the vegetation has, has contributed to it, it, it looking even better, and it's only gonna continue. Yeah, and we head down this way, and we've got some more pop of color here. We've got some bougainvilleas that are blooming right now. Yeah, we worked with Christina Floor. Uh, she's the best landscape ar architect in the state and she understands all the aspects of desert landscaping and uh, was part of the design from the beginning. Talk a little bit about the spirit of sociability and creating spaces for people to, to be able to get to know their neighbors. Yeah, I think that uh, connection is something that people want more of. And today in the US, we build two kinds of housing. We build single family homes that are lonely and have a painful commute, or we build mid-rise housing that can be both lonely and claustrophobic. And instead, uh, this is the missing middle. This is space where people are more likely to run into their neighbors. Also because people aren't just going to the parking lot, uh, that creates more of a connection. And because everyone here doesn't have a car, uh, it creates an in instant bond uh, to, to talk about. Now what you see here with this design is that the windows and the doors are facing this shared courtyard. Each pod has one shared courtyard and it's the defining social space of cul-de-sac. Yeah, and you, you mentioned the fact that there is that, that commonality of the fact that you know, they are more likely than not to be a car-free family group, individual, um, and so they, they have that in common, but you know, maybe they differ in terms of maybe they don't ride every day, ride a bike every day yeah. for all their purposes. Maybe they're taking transit, maybe they're doing ride hail, et cetera. So there is that little twist to that. Yeah, there's lots of different yeah. co commute patterns. You have yeah. uh, some people that are taking light rail everywhere. There's some people that are biking. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some people that take Lyft and Waymo everywhere. Yeah. And there's also mixes all there. Uh, and people also travel different amounts. You've got, um, and so that's, that's some of the different aspects of, of how people get around. Yeah, I guess, you know, because, you know, the whole point of having a live-work environment, too, is you may have people who are living here and working here, as well as I'm sure you have a few people who are work from home. Yep. And that's something that uh, really surged during the pandemic, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Now, I want to swing around here because, again, we see some really colorful artwork and mural uh, you know, pop a color here. Again, you, you had mentioned it earlier, you were really striving to have that sense of uh, integration of art into the, you know, into the actual development itself. It, it almost transforms the development into a piece of art. Yeah, that's, that's what we wanted. Yeah. About how many residents do we have in now at this point? Uh, there's about 80 residents now. About 80 residents now, and you know, we were just talking about that sense of sociability and, and coming together, that cohesiveness. Uh, how's that part coming along? Are we starting to see some friendships being you know, made and, and you know, people coming together? I'm sure I'll see a little bit of it at Little Choya tonight. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the community came together and all kinds of friendships are already, are already forming. And uh, it's, it's something that's really fun uh, to watch because it's something that we were excited about for so long. Yeah, yeah. Have we had our first marriage yet? No first marriage yet. <laughs> It'll happen. <laughs> One day. I do notice that we, we do have some uh, more bike racks uh, within the residential areas as well. Yeah. Um, ju uh, just like when people have, you know, just like in when people have a car, they want to park their car as close as possible. People want to park their bike as close as possible. But you, don't, you need only a small fraction of the amount of space. And so we can create far more parking when they're for bikes. Yeah. Now here we see uh, some of the, the structures that are uh, you know, getting to, to this stage where they're getting some of the, uh, the siding up and everything. Uh, when will this uh, be projected to be done? These units start opening next year. Next year. And so we have 35 buildings that are open today or will be open in February. Over there you can see there's a pod with 12 buildings in it. Uh, and then in that's to 35 buildings phase one. Phase two has another 25. Those start opening next year. Okay. And uh, so you can see those here. Fantastic. And if we swing around here, now we have a different sort of 
uh, design feature, I notice here we have a natural surface uh, throughout the, the walkway here. Again, creating a permeable yep. type of, uh, of surface. Um, and I imagine it also helps you know, from, from that cooling aspect. Yeah, so this is decomposed granite. So this is the space between the pods, again, open to the public, and it has a, a different feel. And you can see that the design, uh, there's lots of white, but there's pops of color so that each part feels a little bit distinct. Yeah. Have you noticed any uh, like trends or tendencies with uh, the colors? Um, people, uh, people enjoy having the variety. At, at, at first, I had a question around if it was too busy, but actually the more time you spend in it, the more that variety and that, um, that uniqueness is a big benefit. Yeah, and we're coming back into the main plaza area. What, what do we call the, the plaza here? We call it the plaza. The plaza. Yeah. And so again, we have another, another piece of art. Uh, if this were a different time of day, you would see that there's designs cut out in the metal pieces that project patterns onto the ground. And this is one of the center points of the community gathering. There's micro retail is here. There's lots of seating and then it's the home of Little Choya. Yeah, yeah, I can't wait to see it. It's gonna be a lot of fun. You had mentioned that you're looking at uh, about a thousand total units or a thousand total residents. Residents. Okay. Uh, on the on the 17 acres when the whole thing's open, and you can also see that we've catalyzed the area around us where uh, there's now many more unit uh, units uh, coming online, and that's going to really contribute to the vibrancy of the area. Yeah, I'm I'm sort of scanning right now and looking at uh, all the building that is being done. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, the mobility, too, in the area. Um, I noticed that uh, you have an improved sidewalk uh, that's you know, coming along um, uh, Apache Boulevard here. Uh, clearly, it is, has been improved you know, for this development. Yep. I noticed the curb over there with uh, you know, designated uh, lift pickup locations uh, right. over there. Too. With extra wide berths that work for yeah, autonomous yeah. vehicles. And then uh, we've also been working with the city on a bike path going north from the light rail station up Smith Road. Yeah. And that goes up to an outdoor mall called Tempe Marketplace. Yeah. And up there, there's a Super Target, a Best Buy, PetSmart, 12 restaurants, doctor's offices, yeah. et cetera. And having a protected bike lane there is gonna to contribute to the area being a better place to be car free. Yeah, yeah. What has the response been from, you know, the real estate development world? And I'm uh, imagining that uh, people are starting to get quite interested and you know, maybe even getting uh, interest <laughs> from yeah. other cities. <laughs> yeah, when we started, yeah. uh, people said, what are you guys doing? Yeah. How are you gonna get permission to build? How are you gonna get the demand? And we got permission unanimously, the city loves it. Yeah. And there's been lots of demand. And so now this has become the reference project for how to build walkable neighborhoods successfully in the US in the 2020s. And that's part of our goal, is that we want to show that this is possible. This is how people want to live. It's a better way to make neighborhoods. And we have plans for our growth where we want to grow, but also we want to have others build this um, where uh, we want to show that this is actually something that's going to be a more successful project. And we're seeing that now. We have a lot of people visit uh, that want to, want to know more about what makes this special. Why does this work? So talk a little bit about, you mentioned the city earlier, that partnership from a policy perspective. Uh, because, you know, it's one thing to, to have sort of a walkable, bikeable neighborhood within you know a, a city but if it's just a little tiny island of sanity it doesn't really work so talk a little bit more about how you're hoping that this partnership and the the work that you're doing from a policy perspective will hopefully help improve you know the mobility active mobility and maybe start embracing uh, active transit and active transportation a little more yeah, so there's a number of aspects that, that we've done to make this a more bike friendly environment. So for one, uh, we have the first light rail pass that's associated with a neighbor, with the community, uh, rather than an employer. Right. And that's something that others can now use that now that we've created that pathway. And also we're working with the city on building bike infrastructure from cul-de-sac north 
on the light rail up to Tempe Marketplace. And that's going to connect this neighborhood with one of the best bike routes in the state of Arizona along um, Tempe Town Lake. And when we have a concentrated set of uh, people who are car free, um, that can really be an example. And uh, it can actually move the needle quite a bit. So uh, there was one study that looked at the percentage of bike commuters and uh, just cul-de-sac Tempe has the potential to vault Tempe ahead of San Francisco in terms of the percentage, uh, assuming no other numbers change. Uh, but that's how much of a difference that it can make. That's one of the most important things. I talk about it all the time on the Active Towns channel is that our design of our infrastructure really influences behavior and how, you know, that they like to say, you know, our streets and our, our communities, how their design shape, uh, shape us. We shape them and then they shape us. Yeah, and we, just like how they, sometimes people will say people want to drive, and actually no, it's because we've made a built environment where in most of the places you need to, and we've, yeah. we've largely legislated that to be mandatory. Yeah. Um, but this is part of showing that actually, uh, if you give people a viable option, this is actually uh, what they'll choose. Yeah. And so that's going to unlock a lot of other things. Yeah. Uh, hey, what does it mean to be cul-de-sac ready? Uh, Cul-de-sac ready, it, it means that it's a city that uh, is forward-looking, that understands what kind of policies will be in place to make a car-free neighborhood thrive, um, a place that can build. Sometimes the exact design is gonna be different than some of the requirements. Obviously, the parking requirement is a big one. Uh, and having the right bike infrastructure in place. A lot of times people will reach out and say, oh, please bring cul-de-sac here because they see that cul-de-sac will catalyze the change. But actually the best way to get cul-de-sac and things like it is to make the change happen. And you actually can do it before cul-de-sac arrives. Yeah. And speak to that too, because I'm assuming that cul-de-sac didn't you know, bring the metro line and, right. and the light rail line. So that's one of the things that's probably in place of being a city that's cul-de-sac ready, is not only the openness to active mobility, walking and biking, but also do you have a, the build out or the potential build out of a transit line? Yeah, there's a, there's a number of different designs that can work. Here in Tempe, having a light rail station on the site well, was a big part of why this is a wonderful site and also there's some great bike lanes nearby. Fantastic. I'm, I'm sold. All right, great. <laughs> um, I think we gotta get you back to the light rail. That's right, yeah, I've got a, another event before I come back. Again, thank you so very much. Uh, it, it's been a pleasure uh, getting to, to meet you and, and see cul-de-sac and I can't wait to see uh, what the next city is going to be. Thank you for visiting. All right. Wow. That was super fun. Uh, thank you so much, Ryan, for uh, meeting up with me, uh, showing me around the cul-de-sac development. I look forward to coming back for little Choya. Uh, hey, I hope you all enjoyed this uh, quick little episode here on site in Tempe, Arizona for the cul-de-sac development. Uh, and if you did, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. Uh, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health and happiness. Cheers. That's not mine. I need to catch the next one. Bye y'all. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.